Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of God on today of all days, uh, the most important day in the Christian calendar? Um, it's it's really wonderful. On a, on a day like today, it's it's quite normal that we get a number of people of uh, visiting. And so if you're visiting today, can I just say a very warm welcome to you. It's such an honour to have you uh, worshipping in this place uh, with us this morning. Uh, and if you are new and you're looking to get connected or you're looking for a home church, um, then we would love for you to explore that. We have a connections desk just outside the doors there that on your way out, there will be a, a smiling, uh, happy face. We have lots of those here. Uh, who will uh, love to get you to fill out a a Connect card and and we can get in touch with you, uh, have a coffee and and hear your story. You know, it's a wonderful time to to celebrate the reality of being a Christian and uh, the the reality that the the empty tomb, the empty grave has brought into our lives. Uh, It's also a wonderful time to to be part of the local church. Uh, You know, it occurred to me last night that Easter actually marks the fifth anniversary of us as a church. Uh, we started five years ago, and so it's, it's wonderful to, to celebrate that on the day that uh, you know, we celebrate the new life in this place, uh, that God actually gave new life to humanity. Um, and so as a church, there's lots of things that we are about and some things are coming up in the, in the future. And, and I just wanted to, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll just say a word about kids because kids are obviously in the service with us today, which is so wonderful to have. Uh, we're actually in, in the middle of... Um, renovating some of our kids' spaces. So uh, I don't know when uh, that's going to be finished. Contractors are involved. So how long is a piece of string? Um, but there are new kids' spaces coming in the near future, which is very exciting. Uh, I'd just like to point your attention. If you've got a, a bulletin, uh, there's a little red box on the inside there, which says Alpha. And uh, a number of people you know, may have had some experience with Alpha. Uh, but as a church, we're going to be running uh, an Alpha in Term 3, and if you would like to be involved in that, so Alpha is going to be a tool that we use to be able to, to share the gospel and to reach lost people in our community, which is very important for us to be doing as a church. And so if you're interested in being involved in that, that doesn't mean you have to be the person you know, sitting there ex- explaining the gospel to somebody. Uh, there's lots of different roles that, that can be done. If you're even interested to know, well, what's that going to look like? How's it going to work? Come along to a, a training night that we're hosting here, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, which is going to be run uh, by Alpha, hosted here. Um, there are some light refreshments included, totally free. Uh, you'll need to register online just so we know how many people are showing up uh, and how many... Uh, how big the table of refreshments needs to be, basically. Um, so yeah, if you're keen to get involved, please uh, register online and come to that, not this Wednesday, but the next. Right, so for the last week, we have been walking through uh, from Palm Sunday to the empty tomb, how the stones speak. And last week, Pat brought in a bit of show and tell. He had a stone which was from the Mount of Olives, which is that famous site in Jerusalem, right near where Jesus entered the gates on Palm Sunday and said the famous words that if if these people were not crying out, Hosanna to the King, then these very stones would cry out in worship. And uh, I'm I'm pleased to report, church, that uh, after five years, uh, still no stone has had to cry out in this place uh, because of the joy of the Lord that we have. And, uh, you know, I contemplated uh, bringing in a stone that I have at home, uh, which is from the valley where David slew Goliath. Um, But I decided that it was totally irrelevant. I couldn't work it in the message. So uh, I left the stone at home. And I also heard that Pat got a few comments about removing a stone from a holy site, um, as though the Mount of Olives would soon be the Mound of Olives. Um, And so if anyone asks, I literally just have a a garden rock in a special place in my house for no, no real reason. But it's a fascinating idea about stones, these, these sort of timeless objects. And there are so many stones throughout the Bible which have seen some incredible things. What would they say if these stones could speak? What would the, the cleft of the rock in which Moses was hidden as the glory of the Lord passed by, what would that say? What about the stones uh, that heard the sermon on the mount? And I think that of all the stones in Scripture, none of them speak so loudly today as that great stone which covered the tomb of Jesus. Because that stone witnessed the greatest miracle that this world has ever known. And by the very fact that it was rolled out of its place, testifies to the truth that Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. And so we're going to have a look at what that stone says to us this morning uh, from the account in Mark's Gospel. So if you've got a Bible and you would like to open to Mark chapter 16, and we'll read the story together. If you don't have a Bible, the words will be uh, up on the screen. Chapter 16, 
chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And so on Resurrection Sunday, these women had come to the tomb expecting to find something. And if you can imagine, it had been the most traumatic weekend of their lives. I wonder how your weekend's gone. These women for the last three years had been with Jesus. They had seen his miracles. They'd heard his teaching. They'd tasted of his his compassion and, and their lives had begun to so revolve around Jesus that nothing else made sense for them anymore other than to devote themselves totally to him. And then on that weekend, they watched as he was betrayed by a close friend. He was arrested and he was put under trial, falsely accused, condemned to death, and that he was beaten and whipped to within an inch of his life. A couple of weeks ago, I managed to cut my leg uh, quite uh, badly while moving something heavy. It was a sharp piece of uh, metal and uh, it was was quite a, a deep wound. And I'm not sure how your stomach goes in those kind of situations, but I'm definitely, um, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, And so I can, you know, stir myself up. Then as soon as I see that, I sort of go, (laughs) no. So I had a look. I sort of knew that it was going to be a a bad one. I had a look and then I tried not to look at it again after that. But can you imagine what it was like for these women to see that spectacle of that bruised and whipped and bloodied body on the cross. Not just the spectacle of what it was, but to know that that was the one person that they thought held the answers to life. And he was there hanging upon a cross. And so in deeply traumatic circumstances, these women come to the tomb and they are searching and expecting to find Jesus who had been crucified. And this uh, Greek construction here, if we were to try and bring a bit more of the sense across into English, uh, it should be that clear that they were coming to find a dead body. They were seeking Jesus, the crucified Nazarene. They hadn't come expecting to find hope. They had not come searching for salvation. They had come as a, as a show of devotion to a dead friend. And I wonder if you are here this morning and you are unknowingly searching for a crucified Jesus. Because the man who lived 2,000 years ago is still a celebrity in the modern world. Everybody knows who Jesus is. But the, the dominant view is that he was a man who was crucified, that he met his end on the cross, and that Christians are people who show their devotion to a leader who taught them some good things about how to live. But he's not a risen saviour, he's a dead leader in a tomb. And if you come this morning and you're expecting this morning to be about religion or you're expecting to find a good moral teaching or encouragement to to live a good life and to love your neighbour, then perhaps you've come expecting to find a crucified Jesus whose only life is the memory and devotion of Christians around the world. But what you will find here this morning is impossible to understand unless you grasp the fact that Jesus is present here with us this morning as a risen Saviour, that He is present with us as we sing His praise, as we receive His elements in communion, and as we love one another, the risen Saviour is present here this morning. And my prayer is that if you've come expecting to find a crucified Jesus, that just like the women, you might not find what you were looking for, but that you might be surprised by joy, that you might be surprised by a risen saviour. And if you're somebody who knows that you've come because the Lord is risen 
and he lives inside you, then my prayer is that you would be struck again with the precious gift that you have been given. That you would be able to rejoice in it this morning, but not only rejoice, but to let the miracle of the empty tomb have its way in your heart. And that miracle is that the tomb was cleansed from the inside out to shine and reflect the glory of the Lord. So how does the stone speak to us this morning? Well, that great stone was meant to be the sign of doom. It was meant to be the end of all that Jesus came to accomplish. And yet, that great stone which was rolled out of its place speaks to us this morning of three things. It speaks to doubt, it speaks to fear, and it speaks of love. But in order to understand those, we need to first understand some of the physical conditions of the tomb. So Jesus was laid inside a, essentially a, a crypt which had been cut into some rock. It was likely a small area inside the stone. It was probably a rectangular opening that the, the foot, the images that we see on our you know, nice pretty slides are probably not historically accurate. It would have been uh, about you know, that high so they would have actually had to sort of lean over to get in. And the reason for that is that the, the circular stone which was rolled over the entrance had to be big enough to cover the entire opening. Because the last thing that they want is for any of that stench of decomposition and of death to escape from the, stone, from the tomb. And likely the stone uh, was rolled and then settled into a groove that was cut in front of the entrance. So that while it might be reasonably easy to roll it into place, it was certainly very difficult to roll it away. Not only that, but we can infer from the, the Greek verb used in Matthew's gospel that the tomb was sealed. Right, which means that the Pharisees who had approached the Romans and said, we want to place a guard outside the tomb, uh, which they were allowed to do, the last thing that they wanted was for the disciples to come and steal Jesus' body and then to proclaim that he had been uh, resurrected. And so they likely rolled the stone, placed the guard and may have sealed it around with wax because that was meant to be the, the final insurance that their job had finished with the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. And so it's no surprise that when the women come to the tomb, they lament, who will roll away the stone for us? And yet, when they arrive, they find that the work is already done. They came with doubt and with fear and they saw that actually everything was already accomplished. Notice how the stone speaks to our doubt. We have a number of accounts of, of Jesus after he had been resurrected and it creates an unusual picture. He was able to sort of appear in a room where the doors were locked. He was kind of able to materialise in one place and then, and then disappear before people's eyes. Uh, and then of course in the moment when he ascended into heaven, he literally just started floating up into the sky and then was taken into the clouds. It clearly very supernatural occurrences and, and Jesus' body in his resurrected form didn't seem to need to obey some of the laws of physics that you and I have to obey. But before we assume that he was just a ghost or a spirit or some hallucination, just as many of the accounts of his resurrected appearances seek to prove that he was a physical body. Right? He had Thomas to touch his side and in that moment he said to Thomas, uh, you have seen and you have believed, but blessed are those who do not see, and yet they believe. And he ate a meal with them to prove that he was there physically. And so that is to, to suggest that actually Jesus did not need the stone to be rolled away for him to come out of the tomb. He possessed the ability to do that all on his own. You see, the stone was not rolled away for Jesus to come out. It was rolled away for us to look in. For those of us who have come seeking a crucified Jesus, who necessarily must be a corpse, for us to look into the tomb and to see the angels say, look, look where they laid him, he is not here, he is risen. And it remains to this day one of the greatest proofs of the reality of the resurrection that Jesus' body was never produced by anyone. Both the Romans and the Jewish leaders could have so easily squashed Christianity within a second if these disciples who had gone around claiming to find him, suddenly they produced the body, but they didn't. And it doesn't make sense that the, 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 the disciples had somehow managed to roll away the stone and to steal him. Firstly, because you look at the emotional state that they were as a group, they'd all dispersed. They were not capable of some cohesive and, and thought out plan at that moment. It doesn't make sense for them to have stolen his body 
and then kept him hidden as a secret and then to spend the rest of their lives radically changed, committed to that lie. Not just that, but for them to then die rather than give up this ruse. It just doesn't make sense. The only historical witness we have for what happened to the body of Jesus are the hundreds of witnesses who claim to see him resurrected, walking around. And every other argument is from an unconvincing silence. You know, there was an investigative journalist early in the 20th century by the name of Albert Henry Ross, who was a vocal skeptic and opponent of Christianity. And he thought, he had a great idea, I'm gonna write a book which disproves the resurrection to show how crazy all these Christians are. But as he set out on his investigation, he became convinced by the evidence that the resurrection was a historical fact. And so instead of publishing that book, he became a Christian and he wrote a book called Who Rolled Away the Stone? And in that book, he says, the stone is the one, where is it? Let me not misquote. The stone is the one silent and infallible witness of the whole episode. Because did you know that the the fact that the stone was rolled away is never challenged historically? Nobody claims that that stone was somehow still in its place. And Albert Henry Ross uh, lays out the series of questions that that prompts. Why, who, how, when? And he says that all of that leads to the one inevitable place that no one had the opportunity, the ability or the inclination to remove that stone apart from the miracle which had taken place inside. And so the resurrection becomes the key teaching of Christianity and and to the point where this story of of people setting out to disprove Christianity through the resurrection but actually becoming entirely convinced based on the historical evidence that the resurrection was real has happened many times and and Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, that if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Can we just appreciate the gravity of that statement. If the resurrection is not true, we're all wasting our time here this morning. I'm wasting my breath. In fact, if the resurrection is not an historical event, then you shouldn't come to church. Not just today, but any day at all. But if the resurrection is true, which it must be, then our lives should be altogether different. As one theologian put it, that Christ died and afterwards rose from the dead is both the central doctrine of Christian theology and the major fact in a defense of its teachings. And what do we mean by that? Well, firstly, we mean that it's not an allegory or a myth. It's not some nice thing that Christians claim, but it's a hugely significant historical claim, one of such unusual nature and magnitude that it cannot be ignored. If there is resurrection from the dead, it must be investigated. And secondly, if the resurrection is true, then the rest of Christianity must be true. Two reasons that that is the case. Firstly, the claim that somebody died a brutal and horrific death, was crucified, buried in a tomb, and then a few days later raised from the dead is the most fantastic claim of Scripture. It's a claim of the supernatural uh, activity of the highest order, And if that is not just likely but historically provable, then the rest of Christianity must be true. And secondly, theologically speaking, the resurrection is an act of vindication. God's vindication of Jesus. Romans chapter one, verse four, says that Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Which means that if Jesus Jesus had laid false claim, if Jesus had not been honouring God his whole life, lived a perfect life, if he had spoken lies about who God was and who he was, God would not have confirmed him by raising him from the dead. But because he is raised from the dead, we can believe everything that Jesus said and taught. Now I caught up the other week with a, a young man who is experiencing some doubts in his faith journey. And can I just say that it is normal to experience doubts and that it is uh, not right for us to to feel as though we are somehow unhealthy or that that we're doing God a disservice or that these doubts make our Christianity or our faith broken. The Bible witnesses to us that even Jesus' disciples held doubts. Even in the resurrection narrative, they were doubting. Thomas 
was doubting. The unfortunate moniker of doubting Thomas. I mean, imagine if that's how you were remembered in, in Scripture. Our doubts matter to God. But the question is, is not if we doubt, but what we do with those doubts. And this uh, young man that I was speaking with, he asked me a question. He, he said, why do you keep doing what you do? He had been involved in, in ministry and he said, how do you know that what you're doing is worthwhile? What's the point in spending your life talking about Jesus? How are you confident in that? And my answer to him was that I cannot escape the reality of the witness of the empty tomb and of the lives of the apostles. And as someone with a background in classical scholarship, I understand the the history, I understand ancient texts, and I understand the science of textual criticism uh, to the point where I don't just view these as, as religious stories, but as historical fact. And you might reject the religion, but you cannot justifiably reject the history. And the reality of what's happening in this moment is that the disciples have gone from utter defeat and depression and despondency to suddenly powerfully and persistently preaching the reality of the resurrection for the rest of their lives to the point where it cost them their lives, every single one of them. And I do what I do because the stone speaks of the truth of the resurrection and the lives of the apostles confirm it. And you may be here with doubts about the resurrection or you may not have even ever considered it to be an historical event. You may have thought that it was simply a, a, a nice teaching, a nice sentiment that Christians hold on to. Well, can I say to you this morning that the stone was rolled away for your doubt so that you might know that there is a power in heaven that is greater than death and that it was shown in Jesus Christ when he was raised from the grave. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've never doubted the resurrection, but you've never quite grasped the significance of what the resurrection, the empty tomb demands from your life. You know, I, I, couldn't, I could not do anything else with my life other than testify to Jesus. And I think if we as Christians really understood the, the significance of the empty tomb, that we would be the same. That we would radically change what our lives look like in order to be devoted to the message of the gospel. And maybe this morning, that's only for the first time landing home in your heart. And maybe God is calling you to a life that is pursued in service of His church, and in service of his gospel. What that looks like, well, that's a wonderful and beautiful journey for you to figure out with God. But I'm, I'm convinced that if we really understood what the significance of the lives of the apostles was, that we would be thoroughly committed to this cause. So the stone speaks to our doubts. And secondly, the stone speaks to fear. And I fear I'm going to have to make this point quickly. But we can see from another story in Scripture, in John chapter 11, the the Lazarus tomb, that Jesus arrives on the scene of his friend Lazarus, who has been dead for four days. And Jesus is about to resurrect him, call him out of the grave. And as he says to roll away the stone, Martha protests and says, no, 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 he's been dead four days. It's going to stink inside. You see, there was a fear to roll away the stone because the stone was meant to keep death away. The stone was meant to keep all of the stench of decomposition sealed away and to separate that which is dead from that which is living. I wonder, are you afraid of death? Many people don't realise they're afraid of death until they face it. And if you were to ask any of the number of people in this congregation who work in the medical profession or anyone who sees death on a regular basis, that people change in that moment when the the reality of, of the unknown is set before them. They experience fear, regret, detachment. But have you ever seen a born again Christian face death? It is altogether different. The history is littered with stories of martyrs who are given the choice of either abandoning their faith or of, 
who are facing death, and they choose death because they know they have eternal life. Last year, Christianity lost one of its uh, best thinkers and and pastors in Tim Keller, who had lost a a battle with cancer. And the last couple of months of his life were full of peace. And his final words, departing words, were, there is no downside to me leaving, not in the slightest. Even last week, we had a memorial service for one of our dear saints here, Del Howarth, who passed away and went to be with the Lord. And those of you who know what she was like in the final months of her life, despite the suffering and the sickness, she was so full of peace and so full of grace because she knew where she was going. And I remember even my own grandmother at her funeral, my, my grandfather got up and he said in the eulogy, people keep saying to me, I'm sorry you've lost your wife. And he would smile at them and say, I haven't lost her. I know exactly where she is. You see, Christians face death differently. You know, death is the one thing that has power over absolutely everyone in this world. doesn't matter whether you are young or old. doesn't matter what your bank account looks like, what your job title says, how many Instagram followers you have, how big your house is, what kind of car you drive, what kind of food you eat. Death has power over all of us and it has for all of human history. And so if there is a group of people who can face death and laugh and know that it has no power over them, then we should be paying attention. What is going on? What is happening there? If you're a Christian here this morning, you do not need to fear death. Do you know why? Because we have seen inside the tomb and it is empty. That which was meant to to be the stench of, of death and of rot has been totally cleansed. That which was meant to, to ultimately terrify us and bring us our end has been de- completely defeated by the death and resurrection of Jesus so that you and I can join in the words of Paul when he says, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh grave, where is your victory? Can you say that of your life this morning? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that your life is in the hands of God, both today and into eternity? If not, then you can make that right this morning. I invite you to look inside the tomb and see that it is empty and there is nothing to fear. Finally, the the stone speaks to doubt, the stone speaks to fear, and finally, the stone speaks of love. And there is a special word used of this stone being rolled away. Um, And it doesn't mean anything special. It just means being rolled away. Uh, But it's only used in the New Testament of the great stone that was over the tomb of Jesus. Lazarus stone gets a different verb altogether. And the reason I think this is significant is because there is a a Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, which has this verb once in it. And uh, it's from Genesis chapter 29, and it's a love story. And I believe that God has has put that there as a parallel to show us how the empty tomb, about the the removal of the stone, how that is about love. And the story from Genesis 29 is the love story between Jacob and Rachel. Jacob arrives at uh, this well, and over the well is this great stone to cover it. And there are some shepherds around, and they explain that, that what happens is that They have to wait until all of the shepherds are there with all of their sheep and then they work together to move this great stone over the well and then they feed their sheep. And so in this moment, Jacob is standing at the well waiting and he sees off in the distance the most drop-dead gorgeous girl that he has seen in his single life. And I wonder if you husbands remember that moment or if you uh, single young men anticipate that moment, what's your next move? Right, if, if that scene occurred in the gym, then all of the guys just suddenly move the pin down a couple of weights on the rack. What Jacob did is that he manhandled this giant stone all by himself. He removed it from the top of the well and then he proceeded to draw water and to feed all of Rachel's sheep. You know, it wasn't just a flex It wasn't just an extra hard uh, bench press. It was an act of sacrifice. It was an act of service. And it was an act of love. And I think there are some beautiful parallels between this story 
and the reality of the empty tomb. Because just as we needed access to life, Rachel and her sheep needed that living water inside the well. And just as we are not able to to win that life for ourselves, Rachel and the sheep were not able to move that stone on their own. They needed somebody stronger to come along and to do it for them. But unlike the stone over that well, which was placed back as a, as a symbol of the, of the new covenant that you needed to keep coming back in order to access God, the empty tomb, the stone is rolled away so that we have permanent and continual access to the life that comes from the empty tomb. And that is a demonstration of both God's power and of His love for us this morning. Now, I'll just invite the the band up as we come to the end of our service. And if you've come this morning and you're not looking for a crucified Jesus, but you know already that resurrection life lives inside of you, then would you be encouraged by what the great stone says to you this morning? Brothers and sisters, our doubts matter to God. And regardless of what doubts they may be, they cannot compare to the unshakable confidence we have in the resurrection of Christ, which we will all join in one day. And you might be experiencing doubts of of lots of different kinds, unanswered prayer, questions about how your life has gone, questions about the character of God. But I can't help but look at the lives of the apostles that though they were wrestling with some of these doubts, from the moment they encountered the resurrected Jesus, those doubts don't seem to affect their confidence in Him. And certainly from the moment they're filled with the Holy Spirit, there is an unshakable confidence in their character. And so that's not about dismissing your doubts. That's not about saying that uh, your, your questions and your, and your suffering don't mean anything. It's about saying, how does the light of the empty tomb shine upon these doubts? When you bring these doubts to the empty tomb and you, and you gaze inside and you see Jesus is not there, He is risen, He is living in me. There's a lot about this life that I don't know, a lot of questions I don't understand, but I can have confidence that my life is hidden with Christ on high, that I am due to be resurrected with Him to have eternal life. What does that do to those doubts? You can hand them over to God. Friends, your fears have been dealt with by God. You and I have no need to fear death or its effects because of the renewing power of Jesus' resurrection. And just like that that stone symbolises the the barrier between what is dead and what is alive, it also symbolises what we try to hold back from God. We don't want anyone to see what's going on inside of us because we're, you know, Australians who are all just doing kind of fine Well, the empty tomb says that you shouldn't be afraid to roll away that stone to let God inside because He can perform that miracle of cleansing from the inside out. Would you let Him do that this morning? And finally, the removed stone speaks of God's love. Have you ever just been hit with the reality of God's love for you? Really struck with just how profound and deeply God loves you. We went the other night to witness the the Passion play out at Lake Mugra, um, which is a wonderful reenactment of Jesus' ministry and His life and His death and His resurrection. And it it struck me how when Jesus was being falsely accused and He chose to say nothing, He wrestled with God in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, God, if there's any way, let this pass from me. But He submitted to God's will. And the, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. He put Himself through that and in His mind was you. He said, I need to do this for you. And the empty tomb speaks of God's love for us. Jesus Himself said, No greater love has man than this than to lay down His life for His friends. Not only did Jesus lay down His life, but He took it up again, that you and I can face death with confidence, that you and I can be with Him eternally. One of the things that we do uh, here in our church is that we love to pray for people. And so if you uh, have anything that you would like prayer for, 
It could be in any of the, the areas that have, we've been speaking about this morning, in, in doubt, fear, or love, or perhaps there's something else on your heart, then we would love to just be able to pray for you. We have a team of people uh, who will be over to this side of the auditorium. Don't worry, it'll be discreet. The lights will be down. Don't worry about all that. But they would love to just pray through whatever you might uh, want in that situation. So all through the, the final song and at the end of the service, feel free to make your way uh, over there. And you know, if you've come this morning, like the women, you, you realise that you've actually been searching for a crucified Jesus, that this was about religion, that it was about uh, fulfilling some duty of coming to church on, on the holy day, but you've realised there's actually something real here. There is a living and risen Saviour and you need Him in your life. Then I invite you this morning in the light of the empty tomb that you can become a Christian today. A Christian is somebody who by definition has the resurrected life of God inside them. And so you can do that where you are just by closing your eyes and inviting God into your life and saying that you put your faith in Jesus. Or if you would like help with that, then I would love to be able to to speak with you at some point. I'll be over this side of the auditorium as well. So feel free to come and, and have a chat. And I would love to be able to help you if that's what you know you need. Anytime during the final song or after the service. Now, if you're not there yet, but you're curious, you think, hey, there might be some more to this than I thought, then what I would love for you to be able to do is to head out the the doors at the end and and just see the connections desk and fill out a connect card and say that you're interested in Alpha. And I would love to get in touch with you and talk about what that looks like. So as we come to, to worship God and to lift up praises to the one and only King of heaven and earth, I would invite you now to, to, let's just stand. And as we stand, we just acknowledge that Lord, we do this as a community here. People who who choose to be a city on a hill, a light in the darkness to shine the light of the message of Jesus Christ and His resurrection from the dead upon our communities. And Lord, we stand here in in a long tradition for 2,000 years of people who have gathered on this day to remember that the, the stone witnessed the ultimate miracle and God, that the stone testifies that that same miracle is to take place in us, in our hearts. And so God, we rejoice. We lift up Your Name. We bless You, Lord. We thank You, God. We lift up the name of Jesus. Amen.